Welcome back. Uh, I hope you are ready for some heavy duty uh, stuff because now we will be looking at uh, more difficult puzzles where you r really need to test your uh, tactical knowledge and also your calculation. Uh, I hope that everything we have looked at so far, uh, the tactical triggers, uh, goals of tactical operations, the order of execution of the moves, uh, will help you find the right solutions for uh, the problems ahead and uh, you might want to s save some more time to solve uh, these positions there will be 12 combinations uh, so for example if you solve them at an average rate of uh, 10 minutes uh, per puzzle it would take you two hours uh, in total uh, depending on your level of course it might take you more or less so uh, I would really uh, like to encourage you uh, first to realize what is going on in the position. Just take a minute or two to figure out these tactical triggers. There always is a winning idea for, uh, you know, for white or for black. So, so look at uh, the reasons why there is a tactic in a position. Sometimes they may not be so obvious, so you have to look a little bit deeper. Maybe the solution is not... Uh, in the first move, but the punchline comes on move three. Uh, but always, there will always be some tactical trigger that should le lead you in a certain direction. Uh, so what I will do is uh, I will show the main line and some sublines of the combination. I will explain what were the tactical uh, cues in the position. Uh, and uh, you can of course pause the video at any time. Maybe you have found the, you have not found the first move, uh, but then I show after I show the first move, you want to find the second move yourself. That's okay too. So let's start. This is the first position, and it is black to move. The tactical trigger, of course, is the uh, passed pawn on e2. Uh, and there are some other things like contact on d6. Um, also, dark squares are kind of weak and white king can be exposed as well. And first let's uh, look at the moves that don't work. Rook d8 pin doesn't work because of uh, simple c5. Bishop f8 also looks tempting, uh, but he will not capture the bishop. He will simply play e5. And after this, unfortunately for uh, black, he's not in time to go or to play rook f1 because of this check on e3. But the right move is rook f8. It's a very strong threat, rook f1. Uh, he has to accept the sacrifice. And now we have cleared the way for our dark squared bishop. And bishop c5 is uh, such a strong threat that uh, it cannot be met in, a, in any good way. For example, if he blocks the f-file, we can still play it like this. And switch our rook to the d-file. Now there is no defense. Uh, coming back here, another possible uh, attempt to defend is g4 to clear the square g2 for the king. But here we have intermediate check. Uh, and the king has to uh, move away, allowing rook f1, and black wins. Let's look at the next example. This is a game by uh, Michael Adams with white. And uh, as you can see, this is a perfect build-up for white. Uh, his pieces have a lot of tactical potential. They're all... Uh, placed, uh, they're all centralized, and uh, black really doesn't have any active uh, play. Uh, but uh, what about the tactical triggers here? How would you realize that there might be something tactical in this position? After all, there is no undefended pieces for black. Black is a grandmaster as well, so you know, grandmasters usually don't leave their pieces hanging. Um, well, the king looks fairly safe on g8. There is not really anything that uh, indicates that there is a, a, 
a, a tactical shot here. But there is one thing. Uh, when you have such a strong build-up, like White has here, and your opponent is passive, this in itself uh, gives you a sign that it might be a time to, to deliver this uh, decisive blow. And here Adams uh, finds a really elegant combination. Uh, the move is knight takes f7. He clears the e file, brings the king out in the open. And now this should be simpler. Finding the, the right move should be much simpler here. We have contact on e7, exposed king. And the right move is rook takes e7. And after that, whichever way he takes, the rook on c8 will be undefended. So uh, we have a double check, I mean double attack, and uh, white won. White won a pawn, but his threats are just too strong. I mean, queen e8 checkmate has to be defended somehow, and I imagine that uh, at least one of these pawns, uh, black pawns, will fall. And uh, white won the game. Uh, of course, uh, looking uh, from the start, this requires some combinational vision, and this is what uh, good tactical players are, of course, good at, uh, being able to visualize things uh, far in advance. So here the, the punchline came on move 3, right? Queen f5. Okay. Position number 3. It comes from the better of defense. White to move. And uh, here, uh, compared to the position before, I think it's pretty clear that uh, what, what the tactical triggers are. There are two undefended pieces, the queen on d7 and bishop on h5. This usually leads to some tactical ideas, but the thing is that the knight on f3 is pinned, so we have to calculate carefully. For example, a tempting move bishop takes h7 and knight e5 doesn't really work, because black will play this intermediate move. And now after knight e5, uh, white wants to take on c6 and on e7, in addition to this rook, uh, bishop on d1. But here the problem is simply takes takes bishop f6 and black wins material. So we have to be a little bit more careful. And the winning move for white is knight e5. Discovered attack. Two pieces that were undefended are hanging. Uh, in case he takes uh, on d1 now, it is a, a stronger, it's a better version because uh, we didn't sacrifice the bishop on h7, needlessly. So this is not good. The best move for black is to take. And after that, you should have seen check, the key move. So you should look uh, for checks in every step of calculation, not only on move one, but uh, on every move you have to look at checks for you and for your opponent. And as a result of the combination, we win uh, a pawn. Position number four. This is a combination from a game uh, Kasparov against uh, Lautier. And this is indeed a beautiful combination by Kasparov. Uh, very typical of him. Uh, and it is based on, on several tactical features of the position. It's, it's not a simple uh, combination at all. So you might want to spend some more time to solve it. Um, what is, what is the thing here? Of course white is better. White is positionally better even if he plays a move like queen h4. But a good tactical player will realize that there are some other things uh, at work here. For example, while my queen is on g5, I can always dream of uh, giving this checkmate with queen g7. Uh, now black is covering that square with two pieces, but again, imagination does wonders and Kasparov found the right way to uh, actually give checkmate in some of the variations. So the winning move is knight g4. It is a counter-attack and it is based on several factors. First of all, the spin along the fifth rank. So the, the knight can be taken, but it leads to a lost position. Secondly, uh, what if black captures the queen? Then we capture his queen and we have a double threat, basically. 
the threat is to the rook uh, on g5 and also rook d8. And a uh, really nice point of the combination is that after he takes the rook, there is a checkmate with knight f7. So this is uh, why he can't take the, the rook on h5, but otherwise, um, simply he cannot defend against all threats in this position. So coming back here, uh, neither of the pieces can be captured, and black might try this move queen e6. He just uh, keeps his queen, and also uh, there is there seems to be no direct threat, right? But this is what I was talking about. The g7 square now has only one defender, and the point is that white has this beautiful move rook d8 with the uh, threat uh, queen g7. There are some ways for, for black to defend against it, but they all uh, lead to a losing position. Position number five is another combination by Michael Adams. Um, here, actually, if you think about the position, it is pretty clear what the tactical trigger is. You just look at the poor position of uh, the knight on f2, and it becomes clear that we might try to uh, trap it. Uh, so, for example, it, it wouldn't make sense to just trade the knights like this. Black is even maybe slightly better here. So we are really trying to, uh, uh, you know, round up this knight so it doesn't escape. And uh, Adams found a strong move rook a3. The idea is to protect the knight on a5 so that the queen can freely take uh, the black knight. And the black cannot really, he has to move his knight, he can't uh, do this because of rook b3 of course. Uh, an attempt to make a counter-attack, again, it doesn't work. It is fairly simple to see that we will win the knight on d4. So the only move here for black is knight g4. And here, maybe if, if you have uh, not seen rook a3, you should take some time to, to find the winning move in this position, because it's really a uh, really nice move. Um, so it is uh, the idea is to trap the knight on g4. How to do that? Uh, for example, what if we just play queen g3? Then he captures on h5. He protects his knight. But the winning move that Adams played is queen g1. And that's a great example of geometry. Again, we are attacking the knight, but this time, when he captures, we are using the geometry of the queen on g1 to the queen on b6 uh, to make this uh, pin and basically this is just uh, over white wins the queen the combination number six we are looking from black side of the board uh, this is another example uh, with the pass pawn as the main tactical trigger uh, so the pawn on a3 can, for example, go to a2, and then he has to block it with the rook. But is this winning? We have to look a little bit deeper. How can black use uh, the potential of his pieces to, to make a tactical shot? For example, if he plays a2, rook a1, uh, even in the starting position, I think it was uh, possible to realize that there is some geometry and the contact on d4. And if we could just uh, take this d4 pawn and bring our queen there, that would be really nice. So, for example, a2, bishop d5, and then if he captures on b5, we take uh, that pawn on d4. And this would be indeed the winning position for, for black. However, here, uh, white does not have to capture the bishop. You can simply go queen c3. And, of course, uh, it's still a very unpleasant position for white, but he's not lost yet. He can still fight. So how can we avoid this line with queen c3? Well, you just reverse the move order. Sometimes this, this does the trick. So the winning move is bishop b5. 
And now he is forced to capture the bishop because of the geometry. The, either, otherwise the rook on f1 falls. So he captures, now we just uh, reverse the move order. Uh, a1 is a threat. And in fact, uh, the best thing for, for uh, white to do is uh, to allow uh, black to promote. Because what happens if he plays rook a1, bishop d4, uh, the bishop cannot be taken, so the only move is to protect the rook like this. And now, I think this looks just terrible for, for example, this is a line that wins for, uh, for black. Um, so this will not do it. If uh, white uh, wants to fight on, he should not play rook a1, as we saw, but e5, allowing black to promote, and uh, in this, uh, at the end, the black wins uh, an exchange for in, for a pawn, but this is good enough, because uh, anyway, his position is clearly better, and actually winning. Moving on to the combination number seven, uh, those who like to play bank or gambit will be happy to see this position on the board. Uh, black has sacrificed uh, two pawns, but there was some combination before where white was uh, hoping to... He sacrificed a piece and then he's hoping to get it back uh, because the knight on d3 is pinned. So, for instance, after queen b2, white has this move and he's a pawn up. So we are looking for a tactical shot, and this time it is based, of course, on triggers that have to do with uh, king's weakness. Uh, weak back rank, and as we will see, also contact on f2 will play a major role. So it is now pretty clear that the move is rook takes a4. It can only be taken by the queen. Queen takes f2. And this is another critical moment. Uh, you cannot get into this line without seeing the the next move for black, otherwise the position might be just lost. So hopefully you have seen that you have foreseen that black has this beautiful move knight e1, um, blocking the rook on a1 with a double threat of uh, queen g2 and queen f1 checkmate, and I believe there is no defense against uh, one of these threats. So, otherwise, if you just if you have calculated knight f4, this will not work because of rook g3. Combination number eight. Uh, combination number eight will show you that tactical ideas uh, might uh, just as well be used in defense. Uh, it's not always that we use them just for uh, attack. Uh, for example, in this position, it is quite clear that uh, black is on the defensive, and the question is what to do in this tough situation. His, uh, there is a check, and also his bishop is hanging. And, you know, automatic move would be king f8, and then to see what happens, but the problem here is that uh, white has a counter tactic. Maybe you have seen it. So for this you need a little bit of visualization to realize that rook on c8 is a target. Because of the contact on e7, right? And white wins uh, a piece. So king f8 just loses outright. Okay, you might then think that there is uh, no other solution but to play queen f7, but then you still lose a piece. But if you look a little bit deeper, there is something really good lying there for black. After queen f7, first of all, the, the queen is pinned. There is no queen e7. Uh, if queen takes queen, of course, uh, that's that's good for black. Uh, he will have an extra pawn in the endgame. But the key of the combination is after rook takes, there is king f7. And the rook is strangely trapped. So sometimes the attacker is not aware of these, that the, the defender might have some tactical resources and he might miss them. 
Now we have a position where it's wise to move. Uh, it is uh, clear that the black pieces are just terribly placed. And uh, like in the second example, just the poor position of many uh, opponent's pieces um, gives you sort of a trigger to, to think about that there might be some, some decisive action, some decisive tactic. And indeed in this position there is one. And the right move is knight takes b7. Now it is not only a peace sacrifice but also a queen sacrifice as we will see in a second. Um, first of all, just let's see if he takes on c3 what happens. This doesn't work because we have double attack and the knight is protected, knight on b8 is protected by an x x-ray. Uh, on the other hand, rook b7 that was played in the game is met by queen b7, that, that was the idea of the combination, and now rook takes c8. So white has basically, white has sacrificed a piece, but uh, the key here is that black's uh, knights are so poorly placed that you could not call it an extra piece for black. This is just totally lost. Uh, however, there are some nice uh, tactical variations uh, here. After he defends the knight with king f8, there is no other way to defend it. If knight c7, we take... Uh, ah, if knight c7, can we take... Yes, if knight c7, rook from... Uh, c1 takes on c7, queen takes c7, and rook takes e8 checkmate. So, king, e king f8 is the only way to protect it. And now you could pause the video again to look for the winning move. It is rook b8. Using a very nice geometry. If the queen now moves to e7, we pick up this knight and the game is essentially over. If queen a7, that's basically the only move that protects the knight. Now we could do rook c8 probably, but there is again a very nice geometry with this move. After king takes, we are forcing black king to come to e7, and it all ends perfectly with the knight defending the rook on c8 at the end. Let's see position number 10. Um, complicated position, white has sacrificed in exchange, and after rook d8 it seems like he's in a tough situation because uh, the spin doesn't seem to be defense, uh, it, it doesn't seem like there is a defense against the spin. However, white uh, notices that black also has some tactical weaknesses in his position, so there is this uh, geometry along the diagonal, a1, h8, and also his pieces are all on dark squares. Somehow it feels like there should be something there. And yes, there is. There is a move. It is knight d7. So we are making a double attack, and uh, the point is that if he captures, we have a check, and we take the rook, which, is, uh, which was undefended. So at the end of it, uh, Black is equal on material, but uh, probably will be lost uh, positional. So after knight d7, the best thing for black to do is actually to capture. Queen captures. King g8. And uh, since he's an exchange down, he might just repeat the moves. This is always a possibility. Uh, however, if, if white wants to play for uh, more than that, he can play the move rook d1. And uh, the position remains uh, completely unclear, but I think these tactical motives with the uh, exposed black king and weak dark squares should give him uh, probably more than enough uh, compensation. Okay, we have two more. This position here, uh, it's obvious that white has an advantage. But should he continue in a positional manner, this advantage might uh, evaporate. If he just 
kind of you know place for the open file for the queen side minority i think black has more than enough defensive resources uh, there uh, actually where white's chances lie is on the king side and i hope that you have realized uh, that there are tactical triggers there so h7 g7 they're all uh, squares of contact and in addition Again, when you see these pieces that are uh, sidelined, like this bishop on a a7 or queen on c7, this is also sometimes a trigger to launch the kingside attack because you can sacrifice a lot of material and get away with it uh, because his his other pieces are just so far away. And this is exactly the the right kind of problem for that. Uh, the winning move is not queen c3 which might look tempting, because uh, black has defense with the f-pawn. So this should always be kept in mind that he can defend with the f-pawn in such positions. Uh, so to avoid that, to use our bishops, there is bishop h7, check, and bishop g7, the classical double bishop sacrifice. Uh, depending on uh, your level of tactical training, you might have seen this uh, one time, never, or ten times, and then it's super easy for you. Uh, so it's one of these patterns that is so, so famous. Uh, and here, the best, uh, objectively, the best move is f6, but the thing is that black cannot save the material, because uh, now queen h7 is a threat and, and white will... Uh, be just winning too, man, too much material. So it's it's a winning position for white. On the other hand, what I want to show is uh, the end of this combination because there is one important moment which you should have foreseen as well. In this position, of course we want to lift the rook, but precision is required uh, until the very end because rook c4 is not the winning move. Uh, black has a defense, and it's also a famous uh, defensive idea, defense along the 7th rank. So after this, uh, the position is highly unclear. I, I think that white's winning chances are not very big. So this would mess up the whole combination. Instead, we need to give check queen f6. And this way we block out uh, black queen, and after that we do rook c4, and... Uh, the checkmate cannot be stopped. And the final combination, this might be the most difficult one, I'm not sure, it depends. Uh, but uh, let's see, let's see how well you will do on this one. Um, for example, this happened in my game and I didn't find the, the right solution. Uh, white pieces have so much tactical potential. Look at those bishops, look at the rooks, the queen. Uh, there is a pin on the e-file, there, there are contacts. Uh, black king is exposed, black rooks are completely out of the game. And yet, when I looked at this, I, I really struggled to find the best move. For example, uh, something that just uh, is painfully obvious is that we can play for this, right? To try to win a piece. The problem here, though, is that when he moves the queen to g7 to protect his king, we don't have anything. We simply cannot uh, make use of these dark squares. So rook e5 doesn't really work. Uh, in the game, I ended up playing a safe move, since I didn't find anything forced, simply a4. The idea is to capture uh, the bishop now, and after that to play rook e1. However, after f6, uh, black managed to defend for a while. He still lost the game, but that's besides the point. The point is here, white has a really nice tactical idea, bishop d7. And now, the point is that his queen is just overloaded. If he moves the queen now to f6, uh, this uh, sacrifice works, because takes takes, and the bishop on b5 is not hanging anymore. If he goes to c7, rook takes e7, wins the game. Um, so he, sh he should take the bishop now. We take on e5. And uh, even though the material is even better for black, this position is completely lost. 
the knight is just uh, overloaded on e7, it has to move away, and then we take on f5. And uh, the goal of our combination was uh, not to deliver checkmate, not to win some uh, a lot of material, but simply to get a completely winning position, because now uh, everything works out for, for white. f7 is a weakness, uh, dark squares are terrible, so if bishop retreats to d4, and we continue with h4, h5, this just looks uh, unsustainable uh, for black. So that's it, those uh, 12 combinations. Uh, you can check your results, see how well you did. Um, one part that was important here, besides uh, um, getting tactical triggers right, uh, was to calculate uh, accurately. And uh, this is the topic of our of the second part, which will come up next. Uh, we will uh, see what is the structured way. If you don't have a structured way of calculation, uh, this will help you a lot. So what is the right way to calculate variations?